Good morning and welcome to worship. This is our fifth Sunday of Lent. A special thank you to the worship band for our music that they will be um, offering up this morning. Um, and uh, so we just give you thanks for, for being here and doing that for us. Um, this is still uh, Food Share Month. Our our food display it seems to be growing, and I know we've got more out there as well. So thank you for the donations that you've been giving. Again, food or personal care items of any kind, as well as monetary donations, are welcome. We'll continue this through the end of the month, and so this Sunday through next Sunday before our food drive comes to an end. As I said, this is the fifth Sunday of Lent, and so we are quickly moving to Holy Week. We'll have our last midweek service this Wednesday as we uh, finish up uh, some short sermons, messages about the book Outlaw Christian by Jacqueline Bussey. Those services are at 6 p.m. and we have them in person or Facebook Live. And then next Sunday begins our Holy Week services and so we begin with Palm Sunday or Passion Sunday next week. We will be celebrating and remembering the entire Passion during our service. Again, 8.30 Facebook Live, 10 o'clock in person. I'm especially interested if any of you who are some of the regular watchers on Facebook Live, and I know some of you have also been readers when we were pre-pandemic, living our pre-pandemic life. And so if you are watching this morning and you're a typical 8.30 kind of person and would be willing to come into the sanctuary next week, there's will just be a few of us here, and do some short readings, a short reading or two for me, no hard words, no biblical words, so don't worry <laughs> about that. Um, we would be happy to have you come and join us. So just shoot me an email or give us a call uh, tomorrow or Tuesday and let us know. Okay, so that's next Sunday. And then Thursday, April 1st, is uh, our Monday Thursday worship. And we typically have a drama, you know that. And so this year we are going to again have a drama. It will be similar to but different from the script and the drama that we've had in past years. And so something hopefully familiar and a little bit new, 6 p.m. on Thursday and 6 p.m. on Friday for our Good Friday worship services. Both will also be on Facebook Live. Our service on Friday is a prayer service. Um, at the foot of the cross is really the way to think about it. And then Easter Sunday, 8.30, as always, Facebook Live, as always. But we invite you to also be coming and joining us if you are comfortable with that, of course. If you want to come and join us, we will have an in-person service on Easter Sunday as well at 8.30, in addition to Facebook Live. And then 10.30 we'll have an outdoor worship service. And it is spring now, happy spring. So I'm confident that it will be wonderful weather. I'm hoping and praying it will be wonderful weather and we will be outside for that second service. If you are planning on joining us via Facebook Live for any or all of those services, I invite you to stop in. Hopefully I'll have it ready later this week, certainly next week. Um, there will, we'll, let's just stop in and pick up some communion uh, elements, take home community kits if you are running out of those. And there are also a couple of things I would invite you to stop in and pick up for the Good Friday service as well. So if you're interested in that, I hope to have all of that ready by the end of the week. Uh, my last announcement was just that um, the Synod has been doing, and we have not really been um, advertising it too much, but they've been doing uh, 40 days uh, during the during the season of Lent and inviting us to contribute a dollar for every day. So 40 days, $40, um, particularly for our companion city synods in Colombia and Tanzania. And I was, we were just told at um, one of our gatherings this past week that the pandemic, while here in the United States, of course, we feel like we are finally getting to the end of it. The light is at the end of the tunnel. More and more people are getting vaccinated. So we have many reasons to be hopeful. That is, of course, not true in other parts of the world. And so we both pray for and lift up and try to find ways that we can help 
other parts of the world, particularly our companion citizens. In Colombia, they've only received to date 50,000 doses of the vaccine, which is not nearly enough to even begin to vaccinate their medical personnel. And in Tanzania, it's actually a crime to even talk about the virus. They are pretending that it is not existing. And so both countries have really been decimated by that, as of course has the whole world. But the light is not yet at the end of the tunnel for them. And so if you are interested in helping and uh, providing a monetary gift, we will be sending that through the Southeastern Minnesota Synod. Feel free to write and drop off or mail a check and just put in the, um, the, the memo line that it's a gift for our companion synods and we will make sure it gets to the right place. Okay, those are all of my announcements for this morning. We'll begin service with a confession and forgiveness. In the Gospel of John, a group of Greek people approach the disciples and say, we would like to see Jesus. Today, this is our prayer as well. Help us to see Jesus. Bring us closer to Jesus. As we forget, confess our sin, let us take a moment to realize how much space exists between us and those words, trusting that even when we forget to seek out God, God is seeking us out. We pray. Gracious God, we want to see you. We want to be known as the people who looked for Jesus. But not only that, we want to be people who have your covenant written on our hearts. Why do we feel so far away from that at times? What went wrong? Where did we lose our way? Could you, would you, once again, right on our fragile hearts. We would be so grateful. Amen. Friends, despite our wonderings, despite our distractions, despite wrong turns and mistakes again and again, we are known and loved by God. Like a lighthouse keeper by the sea, God will never stop waving us home. So hear and believe the good news of the gospel. Our fragile bones are held by the great creator. Our fragile hearts are loved by the great creator. Our tender spirits are forgiven by the great creator. Today is a new day. Today, once again, we are forgiven and transformed. Thanks be to God. Amen. And we continue with song.
Let us pray. O oh God, show us how to look inside ourselves for your truth and write this truth on our hearts. In this space, we listen with hope for your words to speak to us now. Amen. Our first reading today is from Jeremiah chapter 31. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Our psalm is Psalm 119, verses 9 through 16. How shall the young keep their way clean? By keeping to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not stray from your commandments. I treasure your promise in my heart that I may not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Instruct me in your statutes. With my lips I recite all the judgments of your mouth. I take greater delight in the way of your decrees than in all manner of riches. I will meditate on your commandments and give attention to your ways. My delight is in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Our gospel reading for this morning is from the gospel of John 12th chapter. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. And they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am there will be my servant also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled. And what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. For a children's time this morning, we are just reminded, of course, that spring is coming. And when spring comes, we start thinking about buds on trees and green grass growing and being able to plant seeds. You heard Jesus talk about seeds in the gospel reading that we just had And he talks about how a seed is just a seed, and it really doesn't do much. The grain of wheat, of course, we can eat a grain of wheat. But the seed's power comes when it is placed in the earth into the soil and given some rain and some sunshine, and we all know what happens then. I was thinking about this on my way into church this morning. One of my packages is pumpkin seeds. And I thought... Okay, one pumpkin seed, and maybe you sometimes like to roast and snack on a pumpkin seed, right? So it can provide nutrition for us no matter what. But I was like, one pumpkin seed would grow one 
pumpkin vine. How many pumpkins on a vine usually? Do you ever pay attention? I'm looking, by the way, those of you at home, to our worship band and those here. At least three, right? Or four, or maybe more. And every pumpkin has, I couldn't tell you how many seeds. And so when you think about the multiplication that can happen, but it happens, of course, through death, which isn't necessarily something that we like thinking about very often. But one of the ways to think about death is that death means change. And again, the Bible talks about that. I think about the Apostle Paul who talks about our death and our bodies change and become immortal, right? And so we even understand that when we die, yes, our bodies no longer work. They are returned to the earth in many ways like a seed. But at the same time, we have immortality and we know that there's new life that happens. But death happens not just at the time of physical death. Sometimes we have to die to other things. And I'll be talking more about dying to sin and to evil in the sermon. And so we know that we can change. Pastor Janet and I this morning were just talking about some of the current events of the week, including the shooting. And uh, we recognize that when even horrible things happen or people do horrible things, that is not necessarily the end that there can be redemption for any person at any time, that death can happen in order to change things. So just like a seed can be planted in the ground and grow beautiful flowers or scads of pumpkin, so we too can be changed as well through the death that we have in our baptism, of course, into Christ. Those of you who have children at home, perhaps when you are out gardening in the next month, how's that sound? It's too soon yet, of course. But talk about what happens to a seed and what that means. As we move back to that gospel that you heard read just a few moments ago, I am confident that uh, 2,000 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus The ruler of this world that Jesus talked about being cast out is probably still in the process of being cast out. We are also still in the process of having all people drawn to Christ himself. I am also pretty sure that one day this proclamation that Jesus made will indeed finally and fully be realized. And I also wonder if the reason that it has not yet fully arrived is that God remains determined to complete this work in us and through us. That was the proclamation that you heard Jesus make as he was responding to the request from Philip and Andrew to let the Greeks come and see him. They said, will these people come and see you? And he responded to this simple question with this crazy monologue about the hour is coming and about hating and loving one's life. What is that about? Why does he call on God to glorify God's name? And why did God respond with rumbles of thunder? Or maybe it was voices of angels. The people who were there weren't too sure. What is going on here? Well, what's going on is that Jesus has chosen this moment to proclaim that what is about to happen to him is not going to happen in vain. There's purpose and meaning to the events that are about to unfold, even if they can't be seen or recognized by the people who are around him in that moment. Even if we are still struggling ourselves to make sense of that moment almost 2,000 years later. So let's set the scene for where this conversation happens. Jesus has ridden into Jerusalem on a donkey, setting up this alternative display of power in contrast to the emperor empire. In other words, perhaps in contrast to one of the rulers of the world at the time. Dominic Crossan and Marcus Borg are biblical scholars, and they argue that on the opposite side of the city, about the same time that day, it's likely that the Roman governor Pontius Pilate was also processing into the city with his own column of cavalry and soldiers. They write, Jesus' procession proclaimed the kingdom of God. 
Pilate proclaimed the power of empire. These two processions embody the central conflict of the week that in turn led to the crucifixion of Jesus. This statement by Jesus that the ruler of the world is going to be cast out and that he, once lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to him, makes public and permanent God's will and intent. And we know, of course, what happened next. We know that by the end of the week, Jesus was hanging on a cross, dying in the most horrific form of execution in use at the time. And we also know that a few days later, he will indeed be lifted up from the earth and that the process of drawing all people to him and to God will have begun. We also know what this meant for the disciples and the followers who were witnesses to it all. And we know what it meant for the early Christian church and for the people who lived in all the centuries that followed. We know that in the last 2,000 years, there have been times when the church and its people have indeed borne much fruit for the kingdom of God. But we also know that there have been way too many times when the ruler of this world was a powerful influence on that very same church. But what does it mean for us today in 2021? What is the status of the ruler of this world? And when will God's work of drawing all people to God's self finally be completed? I said I was confident that the ruler of this world is still in the process of being cast out. If we understand that the ruler of this world is sin and evil and suffering, then it is not hard to see the ruler's presence all around us. Politicians are so busy finding ways to blame one another and make sure that the other side doesn't get a, a win that they have forgotten how to collaborate and work for the common good of all. Wealth continues to be concentrated in fewer and fewer hands. And the rest of us have learned really well how to blame each other for all these things that are really beyond our own control. Racism continues to devastate our relationships and literally take away life itself. And those are just a few examples of sin's stranglehold. In our own homes and neighborhoods, a third of us are food insecure. Our children are dealing with anxiety at record numbers. Our elderly are lonely and isolated, not just by a pandemic, but as a consequence as well about how we treat one another. Families of all kinds have been split apart because I've become so convinced on the rightness of my beliefs and the wrongness of yours. Again, the list of all that is wrong is endless. And into the midst of all of that comes death. But not just any death, you see. What comes is the death of Jesus on the cross. That death came 2,000 years ago, and it comes to us today. And it is death and resurrection that provides the only hope possible to drive out the sin and the evil of this world once and for all. It is for this reason that the death of Jesus was not in vain. It is in his life and death that Jesus exposes the ruler of the world for what it is, that sin and evil is an opponent of God's ultimate purpose. Sin and evil is indeed a way of death instead of life. And it is in his life and death and resurrection that Jesus affords the world the opportunity to reject sin and death and the power of the devil and instead to allow God to draw all of us to God's self. And then, as we are drawn to God, we, in turn, have the opportunity to condemn the sin and evil that is still in this world. As we are drawn to God, we are then able to work together to expose the systems all around us that perpetuate evil, including the systems that claim to be doing good. We can expose the systems that do things like maintain racism and sexism and poverty and violence. Because you see, when we are able to help unmask 
all that is wrong in the world, it is only then that sin and evil will begin to lose its power. When we allow ourselves to die to a way of life that is shaped by sin, then, only then, can we begin to live a way of life shaped by Jesus. And only then, will the ruler of this world finally be cast out. And we know this is not an easy way of life. Jesus made that clear when he insists that we must love our own life less than we love the life of others and that the only way of following him is a way of service and sacrifice. But this is the only way of life worth living. Ultimately, this is the only way, the truth, and the life. Please pray with me. Jesus, in your sacrifice and death on the cross, you revealed the sin and evil of this world. And as you were lifted up from the earth, you overcame the power of sin and evil. Now you call us to come to you and live in you and in your way of life through our own service and sacrifice for the sake of the other. Give us the wisdom, strength, and courage to live out this way each and every day in our homes, our schools, our workplaces, our neighborhoods and communities, and in this congregation. In your name we pray. Amen.
invite you to profess the affirmation of faith. We believe that flowers need the rain. We believe that humans need community. We believe that bodies need rest. We believe that hearts need connection. We believe that mornings need sunrise. We believe that seasons need change. We believe that grief needs space. We believe that change needs time. We believe that love needs security. We believe that pain needs art. We believe that joy needs company. We believe that our spirits need God. And we trust that God is here. God is at work in our lives. God is a lighthouse keeper that never gives up. Thanks be to God. Amen. Your response to the prayers of the church, the each petition of hear us, O God, your response is your mercy is great. Let us pray. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. You wash us through and through, forgive us our sin, and offer new life. Make your church a community of forgiveness and transformation throughout the world. Give your people courage to forgive, and through them show the world new possibilities. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. You fill the earth from tiny grains of wheat to the mighty thunder with your presence, and you call us to attend to your will for all creation. Keep us faithful in your service, and hear us, O God, your mercy is great. You promise to write your law on our hearts. Guide citizens throughout the world to shape communities that reflect your mercy, justice, and peace. And give them creativity to work for the welfare of all. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You sustain us with your bountiful spirit. Restore the joy of all who need to know your presence. Those who are lonely or feel unforgivable, those who need healing of mind or body, those who are dying, and all who grieve. Today, we pray especially for Ben, Craig, Dave, Earl, Judy, Patrice, Rosie, Ray, Shirley, Diane, Tom, Margie, Linda, Tom, Jim, Helen, Dave, Lori, Jeff, Brent, Gina, and those we name out loud or in our hearts. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And I'd like to take just a minute to thank you for your faithfulness and gifts and commitment, uh, your gifts of financial support, as well as your time and your talents. Let us pray. Faithful God, you walk beside us in dark and dangerous places, and you meet us in our hunger with bread from heaven. Accompany us in this meal, that we may pass over from death to life with Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered as one in the Holy Spirit, let us pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins 
as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And as you eat your bread, remember that the body of Christ is given for you. And as you drink from the cup, remember that the blood of Christ is shed for you. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. And receive this blessing. As you leave this place, may your mouth speak of God's goodness. May your arms hold those in need. May your feet walk toward justice. May your heart trust its worth. And may your soul dance in God's grace. In the name of the love, the beloved, and love itself. Go with courage. Go with peace. Go with love. Amen. Grace could never change